The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 680 for Monday, October 23rd, 2017. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where you send in questions, tips, and cool stuff found. We are here to answer them, to help share the knowledge and share the love. And the goal is that each and every one of us, me included, we all learn at least four new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include SaneBox. We're at SaneBox.com slash MGG. You get two weeks for free. And if you decide to buy, automatically get a $25 credit there. That is a service. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But that is a service I, I am not sure I'd want to live without. I could live without it, but I'm not sure I'd want to. Also sponsoring us is Jamf Now. If you go to Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G, sign up there. You will get your first three devices for free for life, for free for life at Jamf dot com slash M-G-G. We'll tell you more about exactly what that is in a minute here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut the moment john f braun that's right you are in fairfield connecticut as far as i know actually i don't know you could be in bolivia for as as, as much as i know Sky. Well, you could check my ip address but i could I, easier to do that in the chat room believe it or not than skype skype uh, obscures your ip address from me but yeah but uh, then i could be using a vpn you could deceive you or, or misdirect you yes that's right well, if you told me you're using a VPN, then it's to misdirect, not deceive. That's right. That's a, there's a difference there. We like to be accurate about this stuff. Yeah, I was just thinking about like how meticulous I certainly am. I know you are too, but uh, it, it I like the sip of tea that I take while the pre the the intro music plays. If I time it right, like I get go down, I get the tea, I come up, we do the thing, we chitty chatty for a second, and then we start the show. The temperature of that tea on my throat is like it is a is a litmus test for me as to so how the things are going to go and things are going to go well really? i can tell you yeah i know i'm i'm insane but it's whatever it's well fine. no as you said i mean hey conspiracy theories support them all i emotionally support them all or emotionally emotionally yes, i can't i can't intellectually support all conspiracy theories john i mean <laughs> let's be be honest there are some that i can support but i mean me i am looking for the unmarked Black helicopters coming over the horizon to, uh, uh, yeah, they're coming. I know they're coming. Yeah. All right. Oh, no, enough, they're coming to get you. That. Yeah. <laughs> New world order, right? Yeah. Meticulous <laughs> and conspiracy theories. That's it. That's the, uh, that's what we do here. All right. Now as let's get sub, down to the As a facts. subset of meticulousness and conspiracy theories, Felix mm. has a question. And Felix asks, he says, uh, I have an iPhone 6S and I'm running iOS 11. In settings, I have photos. I run an iCloud photo library, or he must. Uh, he says, I have it set to optimize my iPhone storage. But currently, I am getting a phone storage almost full alert, and I see that photos are taking up nearly 25 of my 64 gigs. Surely, it should be offloading these automatically. Then he, he posits. He says, I am wondering if this has anything to do with Dropbox. I did leave the Dropbox app open last night, all night to back up my photos, although I don't have any offline files stored in my Dropbox. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. And I think you're right that it's Dropbox because let's let's walk huh. through this together. But bear with me on this. So you've got Dropbox, right? And you want to back up all your photos to Dropbox, which is fine. It will do that automatically. It'll take whatever photos it finds on your iPhone and in your camera roll and in, uh, and all of that, and it'll fire them up to, to Dropbox. And that's great. But here's the thing. Those photos have to, like Dropbox has to be able to see those photos to put them up uh, in on their server. And if you have your phone, if you're using iCloud Photo Library, you can set, as Felix has, your phone to optimize photo storage, which means it's not going to store the, the full picture of all of your photos. It's just going to store the um, thumbnails for those. 
except when Dropbox goes to each one and says, I need that photo, then iCloud Photo Library has to go fetch it from iCloud Photo Library and put the whole thing on your phone so that Dropbox can say, great, I'll fire that up to the cloud. And my guess is overnight that that's what Dropbox did. And so you've got, because you've asked your phone or you've let Dropbox ask your phone to download all these pictures to it, it's saying, I guess Felix must need all of these here. So let me keep lots of them local. And my guess is over the next couple of days that will free up. I went through the same thing when I, I didn't use Dropbox to do it, but I used um, uh, Synology's DS photo. And this happened with iOS 10 as well. It was just, you know, backing them up to my disk station, but I had to do with a full backup first. Then it now it just does the incrementals and it's it's fine. It's not it's, you know, unnoticeable. But um, that would be my guess because it's, you know, it's got to bring them down. And then it thinks, well, you asked for it, so I should keep it here. Uh, that's my thought anyway, John. What I'll do you defer think? to your expertise because I am not a uh, currently. A... Sure. But I do I not thought, use this mechanism that you just described. Right. But the logic, I'll, it, I'll, does, it, but does my logic make sense to you on that one? It, it just seems odd to me that the one service intended to do something is seeing stuff elsewhere. Well, but think it, of it. It just right? sounds like it, it's. I mean, it's got to, in order for Dropbox to upload the picture, it has to be local on the phone. And so like if you if we think of iCloud photo library as having the ability to cache content, right? It's mm -hmm. saying, well, here's all your most recently used stuff, which of course is everything because you just uploaded everything to Dropbox and so down it comes down. And it stays for a little while until it says, "No, nah, I don't need this in the cache anymore. I, I got to free up that space." That's that's my logic on it. And it I don't know. Does that make sense? Um I may have to give it a whirl. I, I take a different path. So I, you know, when I plug my phone in, Dropbox says, hey, you want to grab the photos and put them in your Dropbox. And But I don't use iCloud Photo oh, Library. So. It, the same thing would happen though, right? Well, right. It, you you just have the photos on your phone. Right. Yeah, yeah. I see. Because because you're not using that optimized storage function. So I guess if yeah. anything, this is a caution against when you have multiple services. It, it is. Dealing with the same data. Yes. Are they going to... I mean, what they're doing isn't bad in that, you know, I mean, they're taking up space that you may not want taken, but at least they're, <laughs> they are replicating your content. Right, so. Yeah. Right. All right. You want to take us to Eric there, John? All right. Let me. You want me to take us okay. to Eric? Okay. You no, no, we got it. I cool. got it. Let's make it a little bigger. All right. On my dual, fancy dual screen set up here. All right, Sarah has a really good question. So he says, or a comment. In last week's Mackie Gab, you mentioned the new content caching feature. Amazing, by the way. I've had it on since ICR came out, and now it's taking up about 200 gigabytes worth of content. In quotes. Out of curiosity, I opened up the manage storage section that we talked about um, of the system information, and it does not take that space into consideration. It also does not show up when searching with applications like Omni to Sweeper, which we love. Uh, my assumption is that this is because I'm searching as me, not as root. And the files held by the content caching are in a folder that's inaccessible to me. If I were in a situa situation where I was running out of space and I needed to search restricted folders like this, what would you recommend? What's your recommended course of action? Can I use programs like Omni to Sweeper as root? Great question. And we talked about in this past, but might as well talk about it now because it sounds relevant. And that Eric is correct in that at least in the case of Omni Disk Sweeper, uh, at least recent, up until recently, you must invoke it in a special way so that it sees all of your stuff. We covered this a while back in an article from, uh, uh, who did this? Uh, Jim Tannis. MGG it was Jim. Jim. Okay. Yeah. Very, very own Jim. Yeah. And it's called How to Find and Recover Missing Hard Drive Space with Omni Disk Sweeper. And in a nutshell, here's the key. Um, you go in the terminal, you type sudo, and you launch the app manually. Because you launch it using sudo, that makes you like super guy or super gal on your computer. And you can see things that are normally hidden, which was the suggestion here. Here's the bad news, though, Dave, and everybody. 
Unfortunately, it looks like High Sierra, either due to changes underneath the hood and or APFS, won't even see at least my APFS formatted SSD under High Sierra. I had the old version, Dave. Oh, I was going to say, that they've, I think got, is the problem. they've got some nightly builds that, that will work. Yeah, the Omni Group. And you're getting to the solution, out. which yeah. is looking at their page, they said, you know what? This may not even have worked for you properly under Sierra. So I thought I was able to run it under Sierra. Oh, definitely. I used to run it as root all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you would see like spotlight. To me, the key was like spotlight and stuff. You, you yeah. would see that it actually took up space. Whereas if you run it as, as you know, normal guy or gal, um, it shows zero, which is wrong. But right. it's because you can't see that. Um, so, yeah. So to what the, what you said and what they say is if you want to get uh, compatibility with Sierra or greater, go to omnigroup.com slash more. And then uh, they will have there the nightly test builds, as you pointed out, Dave. The good news is that I ran the nightly test build and at least it saw my hard drive, Dave, okay. or my SSD, yep. APFS SSD. Uh, but trying to do the pseudo trick resulted in the incredibly useful error, illegal instruction four. You, you know about illegal instruction four, right? Well, uh, no. <laughs> I'm like, dude. <laughs> I'm like, how, how useful, you know, this is a fish shake being a developer. I mean, that's telling me nothing <laughs> that I'm trying to launch their executable and it says illegal instruction for it. The thing is it runs and it sees the disk, but it will not show you the system space. So the conclusion I can make right now, Dave, is that the guys who make this software um, either keep an eye on Omni Group and, uh, and their nightly builds and they'll fix whatever's wrong, uh, like this illegal instruction for, mm -hmm. or th there are other packages um, off the top of my head. I huh. Do you recall any? I mean, there, there, are other, there, there are a few other utilities that do a survey other than Apple's OS that do a survey of your hard drive and tell you where the space is being taken up. Yeah. So um, Brian Monroe in the chat room has hmm. recommended one called Disk Inventory X or Disk Inventory 10. Huh. Uh, cool. So, yep, that's that's one. And then uh, I always used to use one. I really, I use Omni Disk Sweeper because I, I like the UI that it gives me. But Daisy Disk is another one that uh, that I've used over the years that will do that. But I haven't tried either one of those in High Sierra. Brian Monroe is checking Disk Inventory X in uh, in High Sierra right now. So we will perhaps come back to that before we finish this episode. Yeah, there's... One or two others. One, I, I remember it was like wide or there was some word in there that, you know, made it mm. pretty clear what, what it was trying to do. So, um, so, but I will answer, uh, I, I will answer Eric's question. If you want to look at where the data, if you want to look at the data for your content cache in high Sierra, it lives uh, on whatever disk you choose to put it on. It will then live in the library, not user library, but the main, like go to the top of the disk library, application support, Apple asset cache data. And in there you'll see uh, potentially many, many folders all with sort of uh, unique serial numbers and then just bits of data in them. I, I haven't been able to discern what any of this stuff actually is, but, um, but it's there. So that's, uh, that's where you will find that. So library application support, Apple asset cache data. That's where it's going to live. And, and the only reason I know that John is because I choose to store this on an external drive that previously didn't have a library folder on it. So that made it really easy. Cause that's the only thing in that library folder. <laughs> so there you go. Yep. Yeah. And, and Brian Monroe says disk inventory 10, is running in high Sierra. So now I'm curious if it will run as root unless disk inventory 10 automatically does that. Um, and there you go. What yeah. size is the other one that Kiwi Graham recommends? So we'll put links to all this stuff in the, uh, in the chat room or in the show notes. Yes, John. Yeah. There, uh, no, there was one other one, but um, what's it called? I mean, it's, it, uh, <sighs> I'll, uh, when I update okay. the show notes, yeah, okay. I know there was another one on my, uh, uh, yeah. on my, on my system that does the same thing, you know, graphically shows you mm -hmm. what's taking up all your space, but cool. um, it's kind of a fish shake, Dave. Is it, why isn't the UI telling you the truth? What, you know what, you, what UI? 
Well, in that the the um, I, I mean, a general observation is that a lot of times, whether it be like your library folder within your home folder or or things like this, is that the UI isn't necessarily uh, or the OS isn't necessarily telling you the entire truth. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I do. It's yeah, like some stuff it's like is how hidden. much space is right. being used by this. And it's like, you should tell me it's like, well, no, I'm going to exclude this because I don't want you to see it. And it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm asking. You this I, yeah. I just want, so. yeah, yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I would always run Omni to sweeper as root. When I saw your answer to the question come in, I'm like, Oh no, what am I going to do now? So I have to find out. Uh, you want to take us to bill, Mr. Braun, bill, bill's got another one, a really good one. Because we're on the High Sierra train here. Dude. We are on the High Sierra train. So, um, bring it up. Okay. Ah, all right. So, Bill. No, that's not it. That's it. There we go. Yeah, there's lots of Bill's queued and up. Bill says, one. yeah. I mean, but Bill's everywhere. To the right, to the left, behind me, in front of me. Hi, guys. Can I use the Apple-provided Mac OS Sierra 10.12.6 combo update to upgrade my 2014 MacBook Pro for Mac OS 10.10.5. All right, just... Yeah, that's probably Repeat enough. those numbers. Right. 10.12.6, 10.10.5. So wait, so. 10.12 is Sierra. 10.10 is Yosemite. Yes. And so the question, if I'm hearing you correctly, is can you use Sierra's combo updater to update from Yosemite? Right. Um, and, and I, I think as we at, and I, I mean, I, we're kind of doing this in a loaded way, but, but it, it's helpful to look at it that way because we've had people in the past ask this question, why doesn't the combo updater update me from previous OSs? And the answer is, so the answer to bill is basically no, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not built to do that. Right. I mean, the combo updater is built to update uh, that OS. Correct. So the purpose of a combo updater and Apple isn't necessarily entirely. I couldn't find anything on their site explaining the purpose of a combo update. They just call it a combo update. But the thing is, well, we're going to learn something. At least one thing today is that the purpose of a combo update is to update you within the same major revision of an operating system. Right. So because he wants to go from 10 dot 10 to 10 dot 12, because the 10 and the 12 are different, the combo update, I suspect, wouldn't even work. And if it did, it would totally destroy things. <laughs> right. You wouldn't want it to work. Because be, it, it doesn't it have it doesn't have what it needs because it's combo update. It's a, it's a smaller kind of delta thing. You know, Kiwi Graham in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream has a great perspective on this. He, he says, the words I use are update versus upgrade. And uh, and that's a good distinction there, because with the combo updater, you are just updating that version of the OS with the upgrader. You are upgrading from in, you know, in this case, you would want to go from Yosemite to Sierra. Now, uh, last week we talked about this and and you could not get. So so the solution is that you need the Sierra installer. To get yourself to Sierra, and then you can go uh, and run the combo updater from there. Yeah, where do I get that? Well, now you can. It's interesting when we <laughs> when we published this show last week, that installer was not available, um, and we said so, and and we talked about that. It was a topic of the show. Yeah, it was like Mere, I went to the app store and I said Sierra, and it's like, um, yeah, here's the high Sierra installer, right? But it's like, well, where where's where's the other one that I used that, that I downloaded? in the past. So right about the time we were doing the show, Apple pushed out uh, both a knowledge base article and pushed the Sierra updater or the, the Sierra installer, the full installer for Sierra back live in the app store. Um, it, at the same URL, it was at, you know, a month and a half ago. It just, it was offline and now it's online again. And so you can go get Sierra in the app store, but I would, I would caution all of you. Before you do that, to ask the question, to have an answer to the question, why? Uh, because if it, because there is no hardware requirement difference between Sierra and High Sierra, so if you are going to upgrade and can make it to Sierra with whatever hardware, whatever Mac you have, you can also make it to High Sierra. And if you're going to bother to do the upgrade, 
Okay. I would I would do High Sierra unless you have a, just have a very specific reason not to. Maybe you've got something where the drivers aren't built for High Sierra yet, or you have an application that's just not going to run on High Sierra that mm. you that you know of. But otherwise, I would jump. To, if you're going to bother to jump, I would jump all the way to High Sierra. That, that's my feeling, and, and you know, I don't know. I'm 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 with you. I I, I see no well. But other than the fact that the installer seems to be kind of buggy even now. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> if you can make it through the installation process, then yes, right. definitely go for High Sierra versus You, you want to take us to Olga and just talk through this installer thing that that's been reported real quick here and then and then we'll and then we'll go to Ken, John. Yeah, this was a kind of a nightmare, but uh, Olga was not the only one. So right. uh, Olga writes in again in the High Sierra thread. Hi guys, I've recently upgraded to High Sierra and got myself a problem. My MacBook Air has a boot camp partition. I set it up so that the default boot is Windows. After upgrading to High Sierra, that has changed. So the Mac tries to boot with OS X uh, or Mac OS now, um, but it stumbles and gives me this window image attached. However, if I hold the option key during boot, I get to pick the OS to boot from. If I select the OS X, it boots normally. What's going on? Um, very timely, and I'll tell you what's going on. It's a buggy installer. Because <laughs> the message that she sent a, a screenshot of, um, thank you very much, it says the path system installation packages OS install MPKG appears to be missing or damaged. So basically what's happening in her case is that the installation process aborted itself because it couldn't find something that the installer expected to find. Probably due to a copy from a disk image to your hard drive, Dave, right? Well, that yeah. Seems to be what this is saying is like, well, the thing that I expected to be here isn't here. So I get this up, is, man. This is a no and this is a known issue. Brian Monroe in the chat room uh notes that there was a buggy installer that mm -hmm. Apple servers were distributing a couple uh, a few weeks ago or up until a few weeks ago. And then they, they fixed it pretty quickly, but it sounds like Olga and, and anyone else that's, that's suffering from this has that buggy installer. So that really the answer is just go download a new installer. Uh, yes. So that you have the right one and, and you can, you can do it. The I right mean, the way. other answer, if you're feeling adventurous is that I did find on stack exchange, Oh. Uh, people that ran into the uh, uh, same error. And there is a way, if you want to dig into the terminal, to do the work that the installer was supposed to do. And that basically the the, the resolution is that, well, I'm with you. The thing is, that, again, if you want to get adventurous, you can go in the terminal, manually copy this stuff from that, that the installer should have copied but didn't, yep. and then it'll work. But I'm with you is, uh, yeah, you got to... <laughs> yeah, just just go. The easier it. thing, if you can put a, if you can put up with the amount of time taken to re-download the installer, is um, is to just do that. Yeah, and you know that's kind of a finger wag, Dave. I have as well is that I've been looking, helping people with installer High Sierra installer problems. The thing is, if you go to the High Sierra page in the App Store and you try to download it, the only version information you get on the page in the App Store is it says ten dot thirteen. Right. And that's what you will always get, even though and like, that's disappointing to me because when you download the actual installer and you do a get info in the finder, there is another number, which right. is like a, a finer grained version. And I've actually used that to help people solve problems. I'm like, well, do you have, you know, dot 46? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, no, you got to get dot. I, I forget the exact numbers. But the thing is that the, those numbers have been creeping up depending on where you download the installer from. So anybody, here's some advice and this sort of, you know, we have listeners that go all the way from, you know, novice, but want to know more users, which is great, all the way up to uh, consultants that that help everybody to, you know, folks that rep at enterprises. And then actually there's some folks at Apple that write this stuff that we're talking about that also listen. But and th this is advice for all of you. If you went and got the High Sierra installer, even if your Mac is functional, if you're someone and really everyone I advise to do this, if you're someone who has saved off a copy of that installer somewhere, either on a USB disk to boot from or, uh, you know, on your NAS drive somewhere to archive, go get a new copy now from the App Store so that you're not 
four months from now, pulling out this old copy that's buggy potentially uh, and using it and then running into this problem all over again. So, so, and I need to do that for myself. I have not updated my, you know, my archive copy. I have smart. That's really smart. And I concur. It, it's, it's sad that we have to do this, but yeah, things happen. Yeah. Bugs happen. Yeah, yeah bugs yeah, happen exactly. Installers. So, yeah, um, totally. Yeah. Hi. Right. So enough high Sierra other than high Sierra and my having a weird crashing problem. <laughs> so we have had some people that want to downgrade to Sierra though. And, uh, Ooh. listener Ken was, was one of them. And, uh, Ken actually helped us find the, the link. He pointed to it. When uh, when this when this happened, he sent us the link, uh, which is great to to have all that stuff. Um, he uh, oh, where are we here? I got to find the right Ken because there's so many things here. But he said um, he, he sent in a question. He said, look, I, I upgraded to Sierra. Uh, hi, Sierra. But now I need to go back because I need to run some software that isn't compatible with high Sierra yet. So, fine. So he found this installer, he downloaded it, he ran the installer, and it says this copy of the install macOS application is too old to be opened on this version of macOS. He says, it looks yeah. like I can't downgrade to Sierra at all. And you are right, you can't. Because let's think about this. The Sierra installer is built to upgrade from anything either from nothing or from anything up to and including Sierra, because it knows all about all the previous operating systems. It knows which of its files the, it should move out of the way. It knows which it should delete. It knows which it should keep. And then it puts itself where it's supposed to be. And, and, and there's a lot that goes on when Apple builds these installers, because it's like, OK, what's the true difference between these operating systems? How much of it should we move out of the way? Where does it live? All of that stuff. What the Sierra installer doesn't know about is anything that comes after it. And today that means high Sierra. So when you run the Sierra installer, it wisely stops and says, whoa, I don't know where I am right now. I've never mm -hmm. seen this before. I'm not built to do this. I'm not going to run. The frustrating part is that means if you want to downgrade from high Sierra to Sierra or even down to El Capitan, you have to wipe your drive back up first, please back up first mm. <laughs> and you have to wipe your drive. Right. And uh, and start from scratch and then restore your data and, and go from there. So. So, yeah, that's that is uh, the unfortunately that's once you've upgraded, you can't go back without starting from scratch. Right. Unless I'm missing something. Right, John. Uh, in theory, technically, they could upgrade oh they could the installer to be able to sure and you know windows it they just actually haven't. has kind of a version of this is that you can you can go to restore points within windows to to restore prior system states i don't think uh crossing um os boundaries yeah you know but within a, a invocation of the os you can say hey you know something bad happened can you go back to this other state that the os was in and it'll be like oh sure yeah Right. Uh, Mac OS or, or Unix in general, I think really doesn't have that. Windows does. And sometimes it, it helps. You right. know, like you install a bad driver or something and it's like, oh, well, can you go back to when it didn't exist? So the system runs and it's like, yeah, OK. Well, you can do that with APFS. I mean, it, it'll do snapshots. And that's a very interesting benefit of APFS. Yep. That we'll have to see when we can. Yeah, well, when we, when we can. Right. When there's software that lets us actually do that. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, Ken sent in a second question. And so since I have it open, I'm going to answer it for him here. He says, is there an iOS app to set a schedule for the auto lock on my iPhone during the day? He says, I set it to never auto lock. And at night I set it to one minute. I can't find an app that could set an auto lock schedule. Is there any such thing? And the answer is no. Um, Apple does not really? make this scriptable. No way, because that's a, there's a security implication there, right? I mean, you they, they're not going to expose that via a URL or something that 
some app could could get in and and change your auto lock settings so that perhaps it never locks and then you know your phone so, is less secure. Okay. I mean the only thing I thought of off the top of my head is maybe workflow would let you do it, but maybe it doesn't have access to that. Workflow doesn't but restricted. But it, it, and I don't think it ever will. But the good news is that workflow, which is an iOS app built by a third party that was then acquired by Apple um because it's now an Apple product there's hope that it might get access to some of those APIs that it previously couldn't, but I don't think it would ever get this one. And, and the reason I say that is because I tried Apple's existing scripting uh, application or interface, which is called Siri. Right. And I said to Siri, uh, let me, let me say exactly what I said. I said, set auto lock to five minutes. And it came back and it says, I can't do that, Dave. But you can change it in settings. And it gave me a link to go straight to auto lock settings. So that that's the shortcut there is, you, you know, at least then you don't have to dig through all your settings. All right. And yes, I did answer like hell because, you know, why would I, I, I was just cracking up for those that have not seen. I can't um, do that. Dave. 2001. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sure Siri gets a kick out of uh, telling me exactly that i think i asked her once tell me about hal and oh. she's like yeah i, I really can't talk, I can't about, talk that. about that that's right <laughs> <laughs> hey hal is just a disappointment to the whole ai community oh yeah i think uh yeah i do want to uh thank our premium subscribers uh if you go to macgeekup.com slash premium uh, that's where those of you that wish to can support us directly here at mac geek Cab central and uh and many of you have this week we got uh, there's quite a few of you that either renewed or contributed one time uh, donations to us. And we really appreciate it. I want to thank you all on the biannual twenty five dollar plan. We had renewals from Scott C, Laura S, Deborah F, Mike H, Robert R, Lyndon N. And on the monthly ten dollar plan, we had renewals from Santiago M, John D. Stephen A, Ken L, Nick S, and Ev T. And then we had one-time donations of 100 bucks each from both Harry W and from Leslie B. So thank you to all of you. It really means a lot to us. It obviously helps a lot. It is a part of how we support ourselves and therefore the show. So it really makes a big difference. Thank you to all of you that uh, that contribute and and one of the perks that you get, of course, in addition to that warm, fuzzy feeling you get from supporting your two favorite geeks is that you get access to our premium at MacGeekGab.com email address where we are happy to prioritize answering your questions. So there you go. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really. Uh, let's run through some tips here, John. I'm curious how quickly we'll get through these. Uh, so we will put a link in the show notes to that Mac OS Sierra installer app store link, which is great. Um, last week we talked about, um, QR codes in iOS 11's new camera, because that's, you know, handy. And uh listener, Paul wrote in and he said, I wanted to tell you about an iOS app called Visual Codes that allows you to create Q QR codes from snippets of information. For example, I've created a QR code of my guest Wi-Fi password and stuck it on the back of a cupboard in my kitchen so that friends who come to my house who can't use iOS's new share password feature can scan the code I've created to get the guest Wi-Fi password instead of having to type it out. That's pretty good. I like actually, I, I mean, I like the app, but I also really like that use case of it. That's I, that. what a smart, um, what a smart thing. I like it. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks, Paul. Anything on that to uh, before we jump on, John? Mm. No, I uh, dig barcodes. I love barcodes. Yeah, it's fun. There's so good much stuff. information that is hidden. Yes. Yeah. If you just have the right tools, you, you can, can reveal see. much. Um, listener JP has something to say, so we'll let him go ahead hey, and say John. it. Hey, John and Dave, Pilot Pete, it's JP from California with a quickie, uh, uh, cool stuff, tidbit, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Quick tip. Uh, tip. That's it. Tip. Uh, remember I ranted about how Apple changed the... Uh, 
what the uh, mission control button does on the iPhone, where you, you really aren't turning off your Wi-Fi uh, radio or Bluetooth. You're just merely disconnecting them from whatever network it's attached to. Anyway, uh, you know, two-step process, almost three pushes to do it. And in the old days, it was a swipe up and one touch. So uh, I've resorted to using, uh, here's the tip, I've resorted to using Siri to turn the Wi-Fi radio off, which uh, is brilliant because, again, I hold the button down once, I say turn off Wi-Fi, and old Siri does the job for me, thereby uh, making me free not to have to dig through my system prefs, scroll, find the off button, etc., there you have it. Thanks, JP. That's good stuff. Just remember that turning off Wi-Fi and turning off Bluetooth will make it so that things like your Apple Pencil and uh, AirDrop and and a few other services just won't work in addition to not being able to connect to anything Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Yeah, but it yeah. may also reduce location accuracy. It I may also my reduce. My phone has yelled at me <laughs> more than numerous once times. That. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Cool. Hey, John, I found, I, I don't know where I was digging around on the web looking for something. And, uh, I found this app that you're going to love. You can't use it right now though, because we have a show to do, but it's called network multi oh, no, no, Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> it's I'll called be right net back. network multimeter. And what's cool is you start this thing up and it starts either downloading or doing a ping test. You can set what, which mode you want it in. And, uh, but it's a, it's a, the download just keeps going. And the idea is you put it on your iPhone and you walk around your house and see how your download speed changes at different areas as you're moving. So you don't have to like go to a spot, start the test, see what happens, move to another spot, start the test, see what happens. So it's a real time network throughput measurement tool. It correct. But uh, and you can change the Which download. I like because there are things like site survey tools and all that that let you do spot measurements. But right. this is doing a constant measurement, which does probably the right way to do it. Yep. And it will, uh, by default, I think it's downloading like some big Mondo iTunes installer or something from Apple. But you can change the download URL to be something local, right? So you could point it at, say, a file on your disk station. Right. And that way you're testing your local network and you're able to move around and all of that stuff you know, to kind of see it. So there you go. I Fun like one. it because the tools that we talked about about in the past, like NetSpot is one of them that do site surveys yeah. which basically give you the RF parameters is certainly useful in that, you know, the better signal you get. But this is like eliminating a layer that you don't need. Right. Yep. <laughs> and that. Real time. Tell me how I get the best results. And it's like, well, walk around and, and you know. And watch the watch the meter, but just don't bump into anybody. Yeah. 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 But I, I recommend put, make sure, making sure you have a case on your iPhone for this particular activity because you're probably not going to be watching where you're going. So, you know, if you drop you're gonna your crash phone, into things. Yeah, yeah, you're going to crash. That's right. Hey, uh, all right. Jumping. So there's the, the, that's one of those cool things. It's 99 cents. Um, listener Mark. On the uh, on the quick tips here says, I thought my iPhone SE screen was starting to fail as it was very dim, a lot dimmer than my 5S screen. Aha. I thought I can convince the wife I need to get an iPhone 8 because my iPhone was broken. But after much mooching about in settings, I found in general accessibility display accommodations, the reduce white point was enabled. I disabled it and my thoughts of an iPhone eight went out the window. To be fair, my SE is still running all I really need. Yeah. So this is, you know, and we like to dig around in the settings and, and do things all the time. I just spoke this weekend in Houston uh, for their great Apple user group down there. And, uh, and that's one of the things we talked about both on the Mac and on iOS. A lot of those kind of interesting system tweaks are buried in accessibility. And I'm not quite sure why. I mean, I know like each of them makes sense in the accessibility pref pane, but they have so many uses beyond that. But uh, but yeah, there you go. So you want to make sure you don't have that on. And it's like so deep. So what was this display accommodations? 
Man, like, you just got to dig and dig and dig. It's crazy, John. Yep, there it is. Display accommodations. You can set auto brightness and uh, reduce white point and color filters and invert colors. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to drop some extra knowledge here, John, because it's one of my Thanks. favorite tips. Um, invert colors. You know, when you're at like, maybe you're out to dinner in a dark restaurant or you're uh, at the movies or you're at a concert or something, when you pick up your phone to look at it, you know, the screen, especially if you go into messages, like let's say you get a, a you know, a text message from somebody and you got to look uh, and maybe you got to reply. The background of it is white. Right. And so you get mm -hmm. this massive, like, huge, glaring, bright white thing that lights your face up blue and everybody knows what you're doing. And that's bad. And you're also potentially ignore, uh, annoying the people behind you. Well, iOS 11 has what's called smart invert colors and what invert colors does is it turns everything uh, white to black, black to white, but not everything. It used to be in iOS 10 and before, if you inverted the colors, like your pictures would look all wonky and everything. That's not the case anymore. It's smart about it. And it's really helpful at concerts and things like that. And I, I wish I could teach everyone in front of me uh, how to use this feature, but I'll just teach all of yeah. you. So here's the thing. You can go into that exact same spot, settings, general accessibility, display accommodations, and turn it on and off there. But there is a better way. Go same place, settings, general accessibility, scroll all the way to the bottom to accessibility shortcut. And in there, turn on smart invert colors and now what? when you triple tap the home button uh, or triple click i guess i mean i i don't know if it's a tap or a click now but triple click the home button you get the option to uh either turn on the magnifier or do the smart invert colors and you can just do it triple click the home button boom good to go it's freaking awesome i love it Love, love, love it. I use it all the time. Really where I use it is on stage. If I'm using my iPad to like read lyrics or read charts, uh, the same thing. I don't want my face lit up blue. So I do the smart invert and it takes all my PDFs. And instead of it being black text or black music on right. a white background, it's the other way. And it's easier to read in the dark because you don't have this big, bright white light shining at your eyes. It's pretty well, awesome. It's cool because, I mean, a lot of apps, I mean, off the top of my head, ways... Yeah. And uh, even Pokemon Go at night, yes. they change the the color scheme because they're like, well, yeah, you probably don't want a Correct. blazing bright white background at night. <laughs> but Apple's own apps don't do that. So you got to yeah. do it for them. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and you can add other things. Great... You'll see if you go into that accessibility settings, there's or accessibility shortcut. There's a lot of things you can add there and you can add multiple things and then you just pick one from the from the menu. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I have it set, like I think many do. And by default, that's the setting. I have mine set on auto brightness. Yep. Yeah. It almost always works. The only time is that sometimes when I go to a retailer that requires scanning of a barcode, sometimes I have to jack up the, uh, the brightness because some barcode scanners just don't get it. Oh, your barcode app should be brightening it up well, just like some, wallet you know, does. some some do yeah. yes i have one app where as soon as i show the barcode it cranks the screen up to yeah. maximum brightness that's or what maximum it should be contrast doing. or yeah. both but yeah. um, some don't right right because you know it's a camera and i guess if there's not enough contrast or brightness or both um it's like what <laughs> right hey we have a ton more quick tips to go okay. through and i oh. we're going to get through them but the first thing i want to do is talk about our two sponsors for today. Does that work for you, John? Outstanding. Our first sponsor for this week is a new sponsor to Mac Geek App, but not new to Mac Geek App at all. And that is SaneBox. We're at SaneBox.com slash MGG. You can sign up for a two week free trial for the email service that changed my life. I've been using SaneBox for three years, I think maybe even four now. And it was because one of you suggested it to me. I, this is a service I couldn't live without. What SaneBox does, it works at the server level. You just go and sign up. It takes like five minutes. It's it really, truly. And what it does is it monitors your inbox. And when things come in that you don't want there, it moves them to another mailbox. And it can filter them really any way you want. 
And that's the best part about it. It's you that gets to configure it. When newsletters come in, they don't need or deserve your attention right away. When a receipt comes in, you don't need to see that. You don't need that diverting your attention away from the other stuff that's going to be there in your inbox. Your inbox becomes way more valuable when the stuff that's in it is the things that you want to read. And then later, when you want to read newsletters, you just go down and you find like the same news folder and then you can read them all you want. I find myself much more efficient working this way. They say that SaneBox saves the average person four hours a week. And I believe it. It's crazy how well this works. And the cool part, because it works at the server level, is it doesn't matter where you check your mail. You don't need to download a special app. You don't even need to use a special email client anywhere. You just use whatever you want. Like you're on your iPhone, you use mail, you use whatever email client you want. Your mail's already filtered. You go to your Mac, you use mail, you use whatever you want. Guess what? Your mail's already filtered. It's beautiful. It's worked with every mail service I've tried. And I've tried quite a few because you folks know I try a lot of things here. If you visit SaneBox.com slash MGG, like I said, you get a two week free trial. They will not charge your credit card until you choose to buy. So you can do the trial with no risk. And here's the bonus. When you buy, you save another 25 bucks because you visited at SaneBox.com slash MGG. Next week, because they're sponsoring for two weeks here, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how I use SaneBox to remind me of things. But for this week, we just want to get your email box cleaned up. So visit SaneBox.com slash MGG. Get your two week trial started. I promise next week I'll have more for you about it. Great thanks to SaneBox for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor today is Jamf. We're at jamf.com slash MGG. You can sign up to get your first three devices for free for life. Jamf lets you manage all your Apple devices remotely from anywhere. Built for the business user, of course. There's really something here for the home user and especially something here for those of you that are consultants or that support others, which might not be a consultant, but it might be someone in your family that doesn't necessarily live with you that you want to help with their stuff. When you first start a business, it's pretty easy to keep track of your computer and phone. But as you grow and you get other people involved, especially remote people like maybe a salesperson here or there, it gets harder to keep track of everything. And figuring out how to secure the iPad that your sales rep that's over there lost can be really tough. Jamf now makes that and a lot more, much easier. Using their software, which you do from the web, you can configure settings, protect sensitive information, or even lock or wipe a device from anywhere. Jamf secures your stuff so you can focus on your business. Instead, no IT expertise needed. This is super simple to use. What you do is you install a profile on the device, which happens very, very easily. And then that device can be managed from your Jamf account and you can control all these settings and everything from anywhere. So if you're helping someone and they need you to help configure their mail server or their Wi-Fi, you can push those settings down to their device without them having to go through it. This is very, very cool. And again, can be used, yes, in business, but also very much by the home user that needs to help somebody. Because I know a lot of us that listen to this show help people, and especially by consultants out there that are doing that for a living. Check it out. Go to jamf.com, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G, and you get your first three devices for free for life. So if you're only ever going to use three devices, you'll never spend a penny on Jamf. After that, though, when you want to add a fourth, it's two bucks a month per device after the first three. You'll never pay for the first three. But from four and up, it's two bucks a month per device. Our thanks to Jamp for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. That was like quick tips built into quick tips, but those just happen to be sponsored quick tips. Very meta. Yeah. Yeah, very meta. I, I, I agree. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it is time, though, to go on to Margaret. And uh, and return to the listener provided quick tips. Margaret says, today I stumbled upon a Mac setting that solves a long running problem I have with mail on a big high res screen. The text for the list of folders on the sidebar is too small. I could find nothing in mail's preferences about this and gave up trying to solve it. But today I found it, she says, in system preferences. 
Under the general tab, sidebar icon size controls the size of that text too. Changing it from small to medium was a great improvement. This setting affects the finder sidebar too, but uh, does nothing for sidebars in Safari or calendar. So very cool. Yeah, I found, John, you know, something interesting has happened in, in the 12 years that we've been doing this this show. The text on my screens has gotten smaller and smaller. And I'm sure it's it's um, just that Apple. But yes. No. What What's that? <clears throat> uh, I don't think the text has changed. Uh, I, think yeah, no, the, I, uh, I, I believe the sensor that's being used to consume and interpret the text is changing. Hmm. That's interesting. That's a that's you know that's funny you feel your that eyes. Way. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Are you at the point? I don't know. I'm I'm almost at the point where I think my my eye doctor uh, suggests that I get uh, well, they call them now progressive lenses. Mm, so they because don't sound you're like an old man thing. Right. Like yes, because bi- you're a well, bifocals yes. was what they used to be called, but now they call them progressive lenses to make it sound right. Well, in a lot of times they're not they're not um. It's not just a a flat uh, or it's not a hard change from one uh, magnification to another. Right. It's it's a I think they even have triple ones. They have ones that are like trifocals, if you will. And uh, yeah, but not yet. I uh, uh, I, I feel your pain, pain, brother. I don't know uh, what you're talking about. I just have this problem (laughs) that Apple's clearly that Apple has. I mean, I only use Apple hardware and it just keeps getting smaller. So (laughs) I I don't know what the problem is. All right. Well, get on the horn to. uh, 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 whoever's running the uh yeah well those guys are, are you know aging at the same rate that i am I well that's that's why there's the accessibility yeah part. there it is Dude. see there you go <laughs> uh everett or ev writes in and says um i have a quick tip for you he says team viewer quick support for ios it will allow you to view an iOS screen without controlling it from the desktop or iOS. Uh, it is perfect for when you're trying to help someone remotely set something up or turn something off. Very, very cool. Uh, so we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I had no idea that this was even a possibility. We but. had. Uh, I had mentioned it in the past because okay. I'm a big team viewer fan. Uh, yeah. Team viewer fan because somebody turned me on to it. And for at least. And actually, a, a good caveat uh, when we're talking about TeamViewer. So um, it's free for non-commercial use. Right. And, and at one point, somebody commented because I said, well, you know, if you use it to run a business, then, you know, throw it on some coin. It, it's not a they charge, I think, uh, not quite four figures, but three figures for a business license. Yeah. So it's not inexpensive, but, you know, like you know, maybe good for the small business show. I mean, if you're doing remote support, then oh, yeah. thrown down, you know, less than a thousand bucks a year to generate more than that. Hopefully. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if, you, right. if you're yeah. good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's cool. But um, yeah, the only disappointment is that uh, like, the, as was mentioned, it's snapshots. It's not real time remote mm. control. Like it in is iOS the, 11, that's the difference. That's what Ev is pointing out. Oh, you can broadcast your screen or share your screen to any computer or mobile device. Is that how he worded it? Okay, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's well, yes, but it's also there in the TeamViewer quick support app description. But that's iOS 11 only. Okay. Yeah. So under iOS 11, it's in here. Ah, yeah. it's nice. Okay, because yeah. that was my kind of disappointment with the prior version is that, I mean, screenshots are are certainly useful right being able to do more than that right okay so that's an improvement they made or apple made or, or yeah my guess together, is it's, I guess. it's cool. yeah exactly and uh graham in the chat room is saying that uh team viewer said free until the end of october so Uh-oh. uh you know go go download that app uh, I, I, yeah. i'm not sure what he means by that but um well but go get the app there you go yeah you know, like any business, they, they, you know, have this unreasonable expectation that they should actually be making money. No, that's a good thing. For, yeah, for, yeah. No. Right. It's just, a, it, it's, a, I mean, it's good for us that things are free and, and they're quality products. But sure. on the other hand, you yeah. to make money. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go to, uh, back to listener Ken, I think, uh, with, uh, and with his quick tips now. And I know I have him here somewhere. Uh, yeah, he says, uh, two things. One is on Apple watch. He says, since, since watch OS three and four, 
every time I use an app from the digital crown, i.e. pulling up the dock, the next time I use the dock, I see an app in front of my dock collection and that bugs me. I set my watch to show favorites and not recents. The only way to fix it was to set the app that I used from the digital crown and add it to the dock. So now the recent apps won't show that in front of the dock. So there you go. That's actually a nice little workaround. So whatever app you use from the digital crown, um, if you add that to your favorites and then you can move it around and it won't show up at the front of the list every time you go back to, uh, to the dock. So there you go. That's a good tip. Uh, and then he also suggests, he says, ever since September 19th, i.e. the day I installed iOS 11 and watch OS 4, my IFTTT applets didn't work when the action was an Arlo camera and the trigger was a Belkin Wemo light. So I bought a Samsung Smart Things hub. It's faster than IFT and it has a lot of options for automating things like I can set it to work only after sunset. So, uh, so he's, he's suggesting the Samsung smart things hub. We'll put a link to that in the, uh, in the show notes just for you, not just you, John, but you know, everybody. No, I want it just for me. Okay. Mm. Well, it's just I've for been you thinking for of now. upgrading, you know, I've seen the, so I bought the, um, uh, old link wink hub and actually yeah. they have a newer one that a lot of people have a nice, nice things to say about huh. should. All right. I should check that out. Yeah, I, I think go. my my negative view of a lot of this home automation stuff is because I have stuff that is old, old, yeah, and it doesn't work right, or it doesn't work the way I'd like it to. So right, <laughs> yeah that, that 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 is the price for adopting early is when the standards sort of expand and change. Uh, you know, there you go. So, hey, uh, Rick, listener, Rick, this is. Sent in a tip to Allison Sheridan over at podfeet.com and, and we'll put a link to this post. But um, he has found a way to well, let me let me read what he has uh, what yeah, he has suggested her. because it's actually pretty cool and it's it's relating to photos um, and the people, uh, the faces recognition. He said uh, he was having trouble with the fact that he had added faces to photos in multiple places and previous to all of these updates, those really weren't syncing around. So now you have all of these sort of separate databases that are starting to merge and sometimes things aren't so good. He said, uh, in searching for a solution, I was on my Mac and clicked on the people album in the left sidebar in photos. Up popped the usual garbled mess of images and names resulting from all my prior naming efforts. In a fit of frustration, I selected the photos in the People album. Not all the photos in my main photo library, mind you. Just the photos in my People album. And I hit the delete button. Much to my surprise, it didn't delete anything. Instead, it offered to reset all the names in my People album that I had previously entered. Exactly what I was looking for, says Rick. After making a backup copy of my current photo library, I clicked delete and all the names I had entered disappeared and photos started re-indexing everything, searching for names to apply. Again, exactly what I wanted. So that's uh, that's the trick. We'll put a link to the whole article that uh, that he wrote over there as a guest post on Podfeet and uh, and you can read about it. But thanks for sharing that with us, Rick. This is this is a good one. This is a. I wish there were a better way to um, sort of, it, I guess it's similar to what you were just saying about the, uh, the, the internet of things stuff, John, is that sometimes you got to reset when the newer, better, faster, something comes out. And thankfully in this case, it's free, at least not financially. Uh, or it's financially free. You, you, it'll take some time yeah. to re-index, but there you go. And another long running thread is that if something's not working, yeah. Maybe try turning it on and off again. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> off exactly. and on again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was, I mentioned I was down in Houston speaking uh, for those great people on Saturday morning and uh, Michael King, who was my host and chauffeur while I was down there, showed me something very cool, John, and that is MagSafe lightning cables. Yes, you heard that right. What it is, and I'll put a what? link to it. Yep. So wait, MagSafe is what you have on the end of uh, 
older MacBooks. Oh, older Mac. Yeah, and I got some of those. Yeah. And Lightning is what plugs into your iOS device. Right. Why now would these, you even think combine the two? These aren't technically MagSafe, but it's the same concept for iOS. And what it is, and I'll put a link in the show notes, it's, it's actually a two-piece thing. It's a cable and then a little a dongle is the wrong word, but it's a little uh, nub that you plug into the lightning port on your iPhone or iPad. And then it it and it only sticks out a little bit. In fact, if you have a case on your iPhone, it probably won't stick out at all. Uh, and then the cable fits onto this in a mag safe type of way. And uh, and of course, it's reversible and all that stuff. So the nice part is you've now got this cable that just detaches when, uh, you know, you yank on it and you got to yank pretty hard. But still, you're not going to break okay. the port or anything. So like it's that. a s- mag safe like stress relief mm-hmm. so that you don't destroy your iOS devices Correct. by tripping over the cable. OK, Correct. that's I like it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, at their meeting, like most Apple user group meetings uh before i spoke they had their special interest groups and generally one of those and, and at this meeting it certainly was a uh their, their local um sort of tech geek if you want to call him that this guy jonathan was just helping people uh, with questions they had and talking through stuff and news of the month and that sort of thing and uh and one of the topics he came up with or that came up in this discussion was microsoft office alternatives And it's a pretty interesting thing to think about, right? Because we have pages, we have numbers. And if that's basically what you need, you really don't need office, right? For many of us, pages and numbers do a fine job. Keynote, obviously, you know, in my opinion, way better than PowerPoint. But there are those moments where you need something that really is built to be Microsoft Office. And without buying or paying a monthly license for office, you can use something based on open office. And there are three of them that we discussed at the meeting and, and, uh, and, and that are worth considering the beauty of, of the three things I'm about to mention is that they're all free. So sun microsystems, I believe it was sun. I might get this wrong. Started something years ago, almost 20 years ago called open office, right? That now has been taken over by Apache, right? So the Apache foundation, has open office at openoffice.org and you can get that and it works for the Mac. And then there's another one based on open office called Neo office that runs it kind of inside a Java wrapper on your Mac. And then there's one. And I think I feel like this is the best one. And I'll tell you why called Libre office, L I B R E office uh, again, based on the open office core available for free. You can donate to them if you like, of course, but, uh, but it's all right there. The reason I like LibreOffice is twofold. Number one, it is the most Mac-like of these things. And number two, it supports the current formats of DocX and XLSX, which are the Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel formats of of current versions of Office. Um, And and it, it seems to work great with those files. Whereas the other ones don't support those. You can't save things as, as DocX or XLSX. So, uh, so I, I like, I like LibreOffice the best, but, um, but I, I just wanted to kind of plant that seed out here. If anybody else has any thoughts about this or any additional um, options to add, please obviously let us know. But, um, but yeah, that's pretty cool that, you know, you really don't need, most of us don't need to pay for Microsoft Office, but, there will be times when you would want something different than pages or numbers, something more geared towards being office. So there you go. Well, if you're doing some workflows or, you know, yeah. mail merge or, or things like that, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I actually deleted it because their uh, CD key licensing thing got upset with me. And, you know, I, I re I tried to reinstall it one too many times, even though I have a, a, a license, you know, media yeah. license, right. you know, because they like to do that sort of thing. Right. Last I checked, it was just like, do I need to do everything that office and office? I mean, office is wonderful. I mean, they got, you know, built in scripting and mail merge totally. and, and all that. But for most people, I eventually just deleted it and said, you know what? Pages and, and Apple's free offerings are good enough for me, but these can 
you yeah, know, go to the next can, level and can, that they can understand yeah. more sophisticated workflows yep. um, because they're office compatible. So, yep. um, so yeah, I think I'm looking right now on my computer. I think I have open office. Yes. Okay. What I currently have on, on my MacBook pro. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. And then one other thing that came up was really interesting. Jonathan started talking about live photos and, but he had a very different, it took me a couple of minutes to really wrap my head around it. it kind what of blew are live my mind. photos? Well, in, in iOS, right. The, the default for the camera is to take live photos, which is kind of like little mini movies, if you will, uh, where you take a picture, but it kind of captures a little bit before and a little bit ap- after the picture. And so you get this, this little, you know, sort of mini motion kind of thing that goes like on a movie, like a little movie. Yeah. But he doesn't take them for that reason. Hmm. What he takes them for, he has it set, uh, which is the default that it takes live photos all the time. And I'm thinking, Oh man, no, I turn that off, dude. You don't like, that's such a pain. He says, no, it's great because what you can do is you can go into a picture you've taken and, uh, and, and, and just take a look at it and you can edit the picture and pick a different keyframe. And he says, it's great. If somebody happens to close their eyes or whatever, he says, you just move the keyframe around until you find exactly the right shot that you want and you save that. And that becomes the frame that's saved or that's shared when you share a non-live photo version of this. And it really kind of blew my mind. Like, Oh, that's why you use live photos. And of course with, huh. with iOS 11 and the high image, uh, uh, high sure. efficiency image format. Yeah. Heath yeah. or whatever. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it, the, the, the files are much smaller, not only because of, of Heath, but because it's able to just save the deltas between all of those pictures, uh, so it's, it's very efficient, okay. but yeah, I really like once he started talking about that and that's new to iOS 11 well, as, as well, I think the concern out. in the past was that live photos were kind of a proprietary thing and that you could only really digest them on iOS initially. Yep. And then they finally added support through photos and their other software where you could do other things with it because it was kind of disappointing. I think I remember when you and I went to a show one time, I, you know, took a live photo of you when I was on a prior OS. And right. It was like, well, yeah, but I can only see it on my phone. I can't yeah. Yeah, see right. it anywhere else, but Apple's opened that up, which is, yep. which is awesome. Yep. So yeah, there you go. Pretty good stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. I want to go to, I want to go to Ezra because I, I want to answer this question and I also want to potentially throw this out as a geek challenge. And see if yeah. we've got any people out there. Well, it's been a while since we've talked about syncing two folders on the same Mac. So Ezra writes, uh, do you guys have a go to utility, pre- preferably cheap or free, that quickly and reliably will sync two folders both on the same machine or on, say, a Mac and a network drive? Um, and we have we've covered this before, but it not in a while. So. I want to kind of talk through the options that I think of when I ask this question, but I also want to make sure, you know, we open this up for all of you. Carbon copy cloner uh, can do this on a schedule as could super duper, right? So, you know, you tell it to do it once a day or maybe even once an hour if you're obsessive about it and it'll go in and do this, but that's different from live sync, right? Neither of those things will do live sync. And, uh, and so I started thinking, well, Chronosync will do that. Um, and then I found a couple of apps on the App Store. One's called Sync Folders, and I haven't tested it, so I don't know anything about it. And the other one is called Folder Sync, which I haven't tested. And I think we've mentioned both of those before. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, you know, what else would be the right piece of software to do that and th- and then the question comes up you know if you're looking to do it on the same drive which might be a little weird do apfs's clones start to factor into this so uh but probably not we're probably talking about some software to 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 do it and uh kurt in the chat room says use the terminal command ditto uh to do this i've never used ditto before that's one of those terminal commands that I've kind of come across and, and left behind a couple of times. 
And he says, uh, combine folder actions with terminal scripts involving Ditto. So I thought I didn't realize Ditto would would do that live. I, I thought it was more like like a carbon copy cloner or super duper where you just tell it, go do this. And it does it kind of like our sync would do similar, yep. similar kind of thing. Yeah. Ditto, man. <laughs> Have you used Ditto before? No. Oh, OK. I fiddled with it. I mean, what, what Wait, you to fiddled me- with Ditto. There's a lot of repeated letters there. I just, it's fun to say you fiddle with ditto. (laughs) I mean, one thing that occurs to me, so what we're talking about is syncing is real time syncing versus scheduled syncing for the most part. Right. Right. I mean, the thing that I found recently, which, you know, of course is only available if you have a Synology is like cloud station backup. As soon as something changes, it's like, yep. Or, well, Dropbox is the sort of universally. And Dropbox, yeah, for a cloud-based yep. Yep. one. But like Synology's thing, as soon as a, a file changes and the folders I say are important, it's like, yep, done. Yeah. Because it's it's constantly watching. It's just watching. Now, of course, right. it's doing at the expense, probably not a big expense of processor. Well, but, but like, remember. You know, hey, hey, or, you know, file, or I'm sorry, uh, what, you know, file system events. Yeah, uh, FS events, right. So the OS is actually doing the watching and just reporting up to and it's like something changed and it's like, okay, back it up. Yep. Yeah. Sync it. Yeah. There you go. So it I, does, I don't like, I like this. Carb, I go wonder ahead. if carb, if, if either of the, you know, so the, the, the two big boys in my book is um, carbon copy cloner, which I'm a fan of. And I'm, I'm not sure where you are on the fence right now, but super duper is, I guess the, the, those are the two big boys. Yeah. But, the, but they're uh, only Mac people, but they're but on demand or on a schedule. But I don't think either one. Yeah. The, I don't think either one at this point in time that we should look into it. No, Maybe they don't. Them. Yeah, okay. They so don't. they're scheduled, which right. is fine for what they do. For what they do. Yeah. I'm just curious. I think Chronosync is probably the one that keeps coming up. So, uh, you know, yeah. I don't know. You know, Kurt L says, uh, what about Hazel? And Hazel does watch folders. But oh. uh, yeah, I don't know. You're a, uh, I'm not a Hazel user. I, I, I love are. Hazel. Yeah. Oh, okay. That may be buried in there then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you'd have to <clears throat> trigger an action. I, I don't know that. that I mean, to me, the other, you know, the other question here based on the, or, or the other consideration is that do you really need, how critical is it that the data be replicated immediately? Right. For some people, yeah. For some people, no. You know, right. Like right. we said, you know, a daily or hourly or. So anyway. Twice daily backup. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. No, I just I just wanted to get that out there. So send a, you know, send a note to us if you've got some what ideas do you about do? this. Right. What do you do to sync that? And if stuff? you want to send us a note, Dave, you know where you can send us a note? I'm going to mention it maybe prematurely. Well, but, um, I think it's feedback right at MacGeekab.com. Did you say feedback at MacGeekab.com? I'm pretty sure what I said, Dave, time and time again, is feedback at MacGeekab.com. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. <laughs> and I, you know, I think we're, I mean, we're where we, uh, where it's time where to bring the band we? in. No, we are. I think it's, I think you're right. I mean, we could stretch this out forever, but you know, we try to keep it relatively yeah. reined in for well, all it's still 224-888-GEEK is the uh, number that you can call if you want to leave us a message like, uh, like you heard JP do in the show. John, geek is four, three, three. Five and we love you, JP. We do. Find us on Twitter. Uh, the show is Mac Geek Gab. He is John F. Braun. I am Dave Hamilton. The guy that sometimes sits next to me right there, where you can't see me pointing, is Pilot Pete. And uh, of course, you can find Mac Observer on Twitter as well. Uh, let's see. What else do we have to talk about here, John? Anything? Anything? No, we did that. No. We did that. We I don't know. all the boxes. I may see some of my peeps at a Photo Plus Expo, which is happening this week in Manhattan at the Javits Center. Uh-huh. So if you're into photography, I think you can still get a free pass. Or if you're lucky like me, they give me one for nothing. Cool. I will post a link to that. if you're into taking pictures. Yeah, it's a... Uh, oh, and they have what? this here. Uh, uh, so when, it's not when only When is photo- that, John? Uh, that's this week. I think Wednesday is when... Wednesday evening is when things start, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday is the uh, exhibits. But they also have... Dude, they uh, glommed a VR expo onto this. So that really? should be... That could be kind of cool. I guess VR is kind of a thing these days, right? 
Yeah, have you played with with any of the uh, VR stuff on the no. on the iPhone? Oh, dude. No, I'm not. Oh, cool you're enough. no, you're missing out. <laughs> no, it's really cool. Well, I've seen the AR stuff in in yeah. iOS and, and yeah. on the Mac, but um, yeah, yeah, it's cool. I, I don't know, dude. I have enough trouble with real reality. Are you don't, sure it is don't real reality? Don't complicate my world with virtual reality. <laughs> yeah, but are you sure it's real reality? No, I mean that's red the pill, thing. We don't know. Red pill, blue pill, dude. I that's what I'm saying. Right? That's what I'm saying. I this just could eat all both be of an them. illusion. I ate all the pills. This, wait, this could be a fantasy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure. Although uh, scientists have proved it's not, but maybe. But no matter what reality we're is. in, we totally rock and dig our community and helping you. And you helping us? Yeah, totally. And uh, we, we love Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com, which is the place where uh, that, that's where all the, the you download the show from. They're pretty awesome at what they do. They make it so that you don't really think about them. And that's kind of the point. It's pretty awesome. And of course, our sponsors in the podcast marketplace, Smile at SmileSoftware.com, Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, Barebones Software at Barebones.com. And then, of course, our show sponsors which were uh, Jamf at jamf.com slash MGG and SaneBox at SaneBox.com slash MGG. That's all I got. That's all you got. That's it. That's how uh, we do it. I, I, got, I got a little something extra, Dave. Do you? Yes, I do. And it's some advice for you, Dave. Do you have advice? advice? I, well, uh, the it, advice it, I have for what, you. What would the uh, advice be? I think the advice would be Basically, boil down into three words, Dave, and that's don't get caught. Made up.